Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Welcome to the Delaware Historical Society of the Delaware History Museum. My name is Ivan Henderson. I'm the Vice President of Programming here at the Delaware Historical Society and also the Director of the Mitchell Center for African American Heritage. On behalf of all my staff, our board of trustees, all the volunteers, the small army of people that it takes to keep this thing running, uh, I want to thank you for being here this evening um, and offer you all well, the on their behalf as well. Before we get started, I just want to point out to you on several of the seats um, in our copy format, but also on a QR code at the back of the room if you'd like to um, do it digitally. I will ask you to fill out a brief survey uh, that helps us know who you are, um, how you got here today, and, and how we can continue to serve you in better ways moving forward. It's a very brief survey, um, but hopefully you'll learn something that really excites you tonight um, that will motivate you to uh, fill this out uh, and teach us how to be in a better historical society for you. Uh, this evening, we are here uh, to talk about the legacy of Mary and Chad Carey, um, and to do it in the company of some uh, talented and knowledgeable uh, colleagues and folks who are some of them are uh, really truly called friends. Uh, but before we start, we'd like to acknowledge where we are. We begin by acknowledging with respect. We gather today in the Nakahoki, traditional homeland of the Lenape people for tens of thousands of years. Sometimes translated original people, the Lenape were known as mediators and called grandfathers by the entire Algonquian family in tree of languages. Encompassing the Delaware River Basin, the Nakahoki includes present day New Jersey, most of Delaware, the eastern parts of New York and Pennsylvania, and was home to 20,000 Lenape and three clans. The Wolf Clan in the mountains, speaking Munsee dialect, the Turtle Clan along the river, speaking Punani, and the Turkey Clan by the big water, speaking Unilakipo. Within the first hundred years of foreign impact, 80% of the Lenape had already died from violent conflict and disease. In spite, of famous peace, in spite of the famous peace treaty between William Penn and the Lenape chief Tamanen at Shakamaxa, Europeans forced the Lenape westward and northward to Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Ontario, where many of the descendants live today, named after British General Thomas West, Lord de la War, now pronounced Delaware. But some Lenape never left. Hiding in plain sight as keepers of the land, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware, based in Cheswold, Delaware, the Nanticoke, the Lenape, Lenape tribal nation in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and the Rampo Lenape nation in Mawa, New Jersey, are three of the thriving Lenape communities today. Let us acknowledge the historical and ongoing presence of the Lenape and the Nanticoke on this land where we now live, work, and celebrate all our relations. I'd like to introduce P. Gabriel Foreman. Gabriel Foreman is the founding faculty director of the award winning Color Conventions Project and the founding director of Penn State's Center for Black Digital Research, Dig Black, which stands for Digitize Black Records, Excavate Black History, Dignify Black Communities, Love Black People. Gabrielle is known for her long standing commitment to working in collectives. For a decade, Gabrielle has also been part of a collective led by Lynette Young Overby that engages choreographers, poets, student researchers, community members, in bringing early Black history to the stage. She's the author of five books and editions, most recently, The Color Conventions Movement, Black Organizing in the 19th Century, and Praise Songs for Dave the Potter, Art and Poetry for David Drake. She holds an endowed chair at Penn State and is affiliate faculty at the University of Delaware, where she taught when the Color Conventions Project was founded. She lives right here in Wilmington, Delaware, and she too is my friend. Deborah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a land acknowledgement. I haven't, um, I haven't heard one that is that um, historically based um, and, and thorough and complete. Um, ever. And um, I just wanted to say that that's actually the model and an inspiration for creating a, a, a land acknowledgement that, that resonates. So I just want to say thank you for, um, to the Delaware Historical Society for, for that. Um, this event today is the result of a long, long planning process. 
It was scheduled to come in and um, in the form of an in person scholarly symposium funded by Delaware Humanities. We want to thank and acknowledge them there and secured by the Public Dimensions Project, who has been led by Dr. Mariah Carey, Dr. Lynette Overby, and me and the Color Conventions Project team. And it included a Marianne Shack Carey performance. Um, many of you are aware of the work of Dr. Lynette Overby that was to be across the street. No, it's on the same side of the street because we're not we're in this building. And a celebratory tea in honor of the first known um, Wilmington Black woman entrepreneur who was Marianne Shack Carey's grandmother, as many people in this room can tell you. That would showcase the oral histories of Shad's daughters, uh, the, the contemporary leaders in journalism, law, and activism, areas in which Mary Ann Shad Carey broke various barriers as the first or one of the first uh, Black women editors in North America and also the first African American woman to enroll in law school in the continent. So we want to thank the Delaware Humanities, the Mellon Foundation, the University of Delaware's College of Arts and Sciences, as well as Penn State's College of Liberal Arts for financial support that made this program possible. But we especially want to thank our long-term partner, the Delaware Historical Society, and especially Leigh Breitenberg, Rebecca Fay, David Young. We are delighted to have the opportunity to work again with Ivan Anderson. We were literally waiting for you to get here, Ivan, so that we could <laughs> finally say today's event. Um, and we also want to thank all the people who have come out today in this room. If we started naming people, we would leave folks out. But the cultural leaders of genealogical societies and dance and cultural societies are in this room. And they are the people who have made this city vibrant and alive. And they carry on the legacy of Marianne Shad Carey in ways that would make her proud today. So we want to thank all of you. Let me now introduce, well, let me also say thank you to Lauren Cooper, who is in the back, who is the managing director of Ditch Black. She has lots of flyers um, and, um, and stickers and materials that advertise uh, Douglas Day, our global transcribathon. Um, which will take place on Frederick Douglass's chosen birthday, February 14th, where we come together to collectively celebrate and enliven and make accessible Black history for thousands and thousands of people worldwide. So, um, and it also has, um, she also has posters that um, uh, commemorate um, the mural that we just debuted, the first to commemorate the Public Conventions movement that include Marianne Shad Carey on them as one of the participants of this seven decades movement of Black organizing that is often forgotten in the 19th century, the precursor to um, the National Association of Colored People, the NAACP. Now let me um, introduce today's speaker. Kristen Mariah is an assistant professor of African American Literary Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, and we welcome her to Delaware, finally. Welcome. Please everybody welcome her. She has been a key partner in all of the work that we have done on Mary and Shed Carey, making sure that we honor the mobility um, of, I, I love how mobility actually sounds like nobility as it comes out of my mouth, right? Of Mary and Shed Carey, who was born here in Wilmington, um, but then went to teach in the northern and all over northern uh, United States, and then went to Canada um, after the 1850 fugitive slave law, when so many free people, and she comes from a free family in Wilmington, um, decided that their rights as free people were being revoked and constrained, and that they were going to try something else. This seems extraordinarily important as we wait for a Georgia election, for example, that is happening just in a, you know, in, in, in a moment, you know, less than a week, people are voting today, standing in long lines to vote today. And we know that in Pennsylvania, right, which is the free sister of Delaware in so many ways as we have inherited that history, the rights of free people who were vote in the 1830s. And she was part of the people who said, no more, we're not going to accept the kinds of constraints, the kinds of, of rollbacks to our rights without exploring different kinds 
of ways to define our freedom and our agency. Kristen Marine has insisted that that legacy of, of mobility, that, that movement to Canada, where she, Marianne Shakiri, is actually better remembered than she is here in the United States, is brought to bear in the ways in which we commemorate her in the United States. Thinking about the ways in which the US often has a colonial mindset in the ways in which we claim our own legacies. What does it mean, we think, when we talk about land acknowledgments often, to not think about borders as ways to fragment histories, to constrain them? For the last several years, Kristen has been one of the reminders, the insisters of that for the Color Conventions Project to think about what it means to have memory lodged in the activism that happened across the border that Black people travel to and from so often. She is the person who worked with Lynette Overby to bring uh, not only creative arts partnerships, but also scholarly presentations about Mary Ann Shad Curie to digital formats since we could not meet in person. And she also is one of the people who brought archivists and the family of Marianne Shakiri in Canada and in other places together in order to make sure that her papers were preserved. Bringing Howard University, Archives of Ontario all together to get these papers digitized so that we could transcribe them and make them available worldwide, freely worldwide. So Kristen is a visionary. She is a worker. She is a scholar. And now I'll go back to what I was going to say that is here. <laughs> <laughs> she received her PhD in, um, from the CUNY Graduate Center, where she was awarded the Melvin Dixon Prize for the Best Dissertation in African American Studies. She is a Color Conventions Project Teaching Fellow and a Center for Black Digital Research Satellite Partner. As a teaching fellow, she's incorporated archival research about 19th century Black political organizing into her classrooms. And she's also brought graduate students of color from Canada to our team, and they've been working with us for several years. She has co-led this three-year international multi-institutional partnership um, that includes many of the things that I just talked about. And funding from this work again comes from the Mellon Foundation, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Queen's University, Penn State University, University of Delaware. Working alongside me, she has used an array of digital tools to expand, reach me and the team, I should say. Um, and she has um, uses an array of digital tools to expand research on Black political organizing across the borders. And the collaboration is dedicated to recovering key information about Shad Carey's life as she advanced radical Black feminist projects grounded in the belief that Black lives, Black dignity, and Black equality matter. Her plans for this interdisciplinary collaboration include an edited collection of scholarly essays, which is under consideration right now, which we will all celebrate in the 200th anniversary of her birth in 2023. And with that, I give you Dr. Christian Mariah. Uh, to other fabulous scholars present on the digital exhibit, and I will introduce them after Dr. Mariah is finished. Thank you so much for that introduction. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> Very busy. <laughs> um, good evening. I just want to thank you all um, for being here today. I'm um, coming out on this um, cold December evening. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's such an honor to be able to be here in Wilmington, the birthplace of Mary Ann Chad Perry, um, and city where her legacy actually still resonates deeply. Um, I'm hoping to get to the post office tomorrow before I have to head back to Toronto. Um, so this is a really, really exciting trip for me. Um, I'd also really like to thank everybody who made this trip possible. Um, as Gabrielle mentioned, you know, it's been a long time coming um, and it has taken many hands. 
And so um, among the many, many people who helped make today possible and our prior runs possible, um, I really, really, of course, I can thank Gabrielle Quanin. Um, working with Gabrielle and Shirley has truly changed, I think, the trajectory of what I thought was possible when I really began looking at learning and taking care of clients. Um, I'd also, of course, like to thank Lauren Cooper at Penn State, who is uh, phenomenal. He manages to keep everybody on track everywhere all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Marie Green at the University of Delaware, who's also been really instrumental in helping me to get here quite literally. Um, Ivan Henderson and Rebecca Bay at the Delaware Historical Society um, have also been um, tremendously helpful in making today possible. I'm so really glad to thank you all. Um, and so um, today I'm going to kind of just loosely work through, I think, um, the material that has led to the introduction to the book collection that Gabrielle mentioned. So hopefully um, it will be informative to you, um, but it will also can sort of help me as I try to um, piece together exactly um, what this project is and um, make it understandable for outside readers. So stated plainly, the facts are as follows. She was born here in Wilmington, Delaware, 1823, at a time when owning human chattel was still legal. Her parents, Abraham Doris Shad and Harry Burton Parnell, were born free, but they did not take their freedom lightly. In fact, they were conductors on the Underground Railroad and active members of the abolitionist movement. Education was a central value for their family. They left the state of Delaware when educating black children became illegal there. Settling in Pennsylvania. Their eldest daughter, Marianne Shad, would eventually become a teacher in Pennsylvania, New York, Washington, D.C., and what was then known as Canada West, um, and what we all probably know as Windsor. Marianne Shad began writing and participating in Black political discourse at an early age. She published her first self published pamphlet, Hymns to the Colored People of the North, in 1849 when she was only 25 years old. Um, and actually, one of my favorite um, Mary and Chapter anecdotes from the North Star is a, a brief passage about her, the sort of doings of this really eccentric young woman who's published her own pamphlet. And the reporter mentions that he spoke with a couple of people who've seen her pamphlet, but a lot of people say that they would not have taken it for free. <laughs> and so if she was trying to sell it, um, she literally could not give it away. Um, and what I love about that anecdote is that it didn't stop her, right? Um, she had the audacity to publish things for herself at that young age, had conviction, right, that she deserved to be heard. And even though her opinions were not popular, um, she really just kept going and going and going and going. So in that same year, 1849, um, she also corresponded with Frederick Douglass on the, paper, on the pages of the newspaper, The North Star. She was an active participant in the color humanity movement. And after emigrating to Canada West in 1851, she went on to publish her own newspaper, The Provincial Freedom. When her husband died in 1860, she and her children moved back to the United States and began a new chapter that included working as a recruitment officer for the Union Army, becoming the second black woman, eventually becoming the second black woman in the United States to a lottery, and the first black woman to vote in a national election. In other words, Mary Ashton Carey was a 19th century black feminist with radical politics who occupied multiple subject positions during her lifetime. She was adventurous, unpredictable, and prolific. She was always on the move. And an ephemera like an evocative letter written to her brother at the beginning of her sojourn in Canada, you can sense her breathless excitement for the controversial project of Canadian settlement for black Americans. This is actually the letter. Um, this is one of the things I'll talk about in a second, but um, this is the letter as is um, typically um, accessible to scholars on a microphone um, that was um, created by our friends Ontario in the late 1700s. Um, but this is the letter um, that she writes to her brother um, during her first trip to Canada, basically. Um, and uh, you know, she describes her kind of breathless excitement for 
for project development in Canada um, and also for progress. And she mentions and she writes that in anything um, relating to our people, she is insensible of values. Um, which is such a, a poignant line and so true in terms of her literal movements. Right? And of course, what began as a short visit to a color convention ended up as a major intervention into Black life in North America. A strident advocate for immigration to Canada in early adulthood, she had carried her head first into early Black Canadian political debates where she moved north of the border. She fought to integrate schools in the United States and Canada. Already a remarkable educator and political activist, Chad Carey would go on to become the first Black lady at a newspaper in North America. Through her newspaper, The Potential Freedom, she fostered a critical forum for intellectual and political exchange. It remains one of the most important records of early Black life in Canada, the testament to the broad spectrum of Black politics and print in North America. One of the great things about the transcribers on that we have coming up um, at the um, on February 14th, the first day of the end of February, right in the middle, um, is that we will be able to transcribe some pages of the provincial Freeman as well. Um, and what I love about that is that you get a sense of her playfulness as an editor as well. Um, so she includes really, really important practical information that people will need to know um, if they're moving to Canada, um, but also, um, you know, little tidbits like, you know, you have to be really careful when your kids are throwing snowballs. Because if there's ice inside them, it will get eaten. <laughs> right now, um, so she feels she covered the gamut. Um, I first became interested in Mary Ann Chad Carey because of her keen attention to Black feminist performance in the provincial community. And I've argued that she's the first Black feminist performance theorist. In Black North American, and Black North American women in the 1850s in particular seized on performance as a site of shared concern. And early Black performance in Canada owed much to the Boston national boundaries. Mary Angela Carey wrote a black, black performance in Europe in the very first issue of the Provincial Freeman. And in that news item, she highlighted the social and political importance of both travel and mobility for Black Americans, Black North Americans in the 19th century. More specifically, her interest in opera singer Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield's performance in Canada West. Um, in the provincial Freeman, um, the pages of the provincial Freeman demonstrate how solidarity between Black and North American women was sustained through performance and surpassed national boundaries. Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield's connection to Mary Angela Carey reveals the centrality of Black performance and Black feminism to the formation of Black Canada's version of community. And Chad Carey and Greenfield were both acutely sensitive to the radical potential embedded in Black feminist performance along the border between Canada West and the United States. They pushed racial, gender, and national boundaries together. May I argue that attention to the coverage of Black women's transnational performance, as described by Black feminist cultural critics like Chad Carey and Rupert Freeman, can effectively change their understanding of the borders. So um, that research project led me to Archives Ontario in 2018 to consult their Mary Ann Chad Fox. And what I, discovered, what I discovered during my visit in 2018 was that Archives Ontario did not actually present material in that collection. They simply made the material accessible by a microphone. And the story about Fox is a long, interesting one. And if you're interested in it, I highly recommend um, was actually um, an MA thesis project. Um, Allison Smith's documentary, Mary Ann Chad Revisited, Echoes from an Old House. Um, it's really available online and it charts mm -hmm. the discovery and the preservation of materials, um, as well as Archives Ontario's role in um, that preservation um, and their relationship to Black history in Ontario. So fascinating. Um, but the short version of this chapter of that story, um, the story of her papers, um, is that thanks to some prodding by the Center for Black Digital Research, Archives Ontario has finally decided to digitize these papers. Yeah, and so this plate took a little bit more than, um, and you know, you can go into a big room. Um, they still have tons of microphone on the shoes, and you know, you can sort of decide which papers you want to scan. You don't have to print them anymore, you can save them to a USB key. Um, but it still looks a lot like it would have um, back in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, this is a photograph of the, um, that same letter um, that I was able to take this past February at Archives Ontario. 
Um, and they've recently begun to actually create some very um, high quality um, digital scans of these papers. Um, and so this is what the transcribed model was based on um, in February. And it will be the first time that digitized versions of these papers will be publicly accessible, um, accessible online. Um, and the transcriptions that develop from this event will also eventually be um, accessible online. And so um, it feels almost like an understatement to say that the result of this project will really transform our understanding of Mary Asha Carey and her world, right? Um, I am already um, touched and fascinated by the correspondence between Mary Asha Carey and people like William Still. Um, and the kinds of um, deep intellectual friendships that they were able to sustain, right, um, across um, huge periods of time and wars. And so, um, to me, this is really, truly, truly exciting. We don't yet know what the implications um, will be of this massive transcribed bond. Um, one of the great things about scholarship, um, literary interpretation, and historical interpretation, right, is that different people will take a look at these transcriptions and then come to different conclusions and different. Um, so I think that we really are on the verge of something I'm quite new and exciting. But it's safe to say that almost 200 years after her birth, um, we are starting to take Mary Angela Carey's Black feminist activism and cultural criticism seriously. We owe so much to her in the here and now. And I'm sure that many of you know of Jane Rowe's biography of Mary Angela Carey. Mary Angela Carey, the Black Press and Protest in the 19th Century, remains the most comprehensive single authored work about Mary Angela Carey nearly 25 years after its publication. Rose Scholarship situates Mary Ann Chad Carey in a long line of Black women journalists that includes the legendary Adam Wells. But Rose's work also reminds us that Mary Ann Chad Carey is the foremother of contemporary Black journalists and figures like Nicole Anna Jones in the United States and Anna Abadanton in Canada, um, a Black journalist who just founded a Center for Journalism at Carleton University and that is in fact named after Mary Ann Chad and it's one of the first um, research institutions that's really um, been named in her honor. When part of what I aim to do um, personally in terms of um, the scholarly collection of essays um, that I'm working on is to make an argument for the significance of her cultural criticism in her time and ours. Despite her sizable accomplishments and her impact on Black life in North America, Mary Angela Carey in the Here and Now will be the first edited collection about this iconoclastic thinker. And through this collection, the contributors and I seek to celebrate the lasting impact of her cultural influence and her intellectual contributions. Why is Mary Angela Carey still significant? To begin with, she was a member of the class of Black feminist intellectuals that would become known as race women. Scholar Brittany Cooper explains that when race women explicitly fashioned for themselves a public duty to serve with equal through diligence and careful intellectual work, and attention to proving the intellectual character of the race. Cooper focuses on Black women intellectuals post reconstruction. Although Cooper focuses on Black women intellectuals post reconstruction, when we look at Mary Angela Carey, we see evidence that the activist tradition of Black women intellectuals in North America has long roots. She stands as an early model of how Black women could seize opportunities to shape public discourse while overcoming substantial barriers. As with the story of Martha Jones with it, Chad Carey was part of the Black vanguard. But she faced, but she faced par harsh public criticism and rejection for her efforts. Again, and as I mentioned before, describing her first pamphlet, History of Colored People of the North, a correspondent in North Star reported that very little money has been paid for it. And some readers said that they, had they known the work contains some of the things which it does, they would not have had it as a gift. And yet, Chad Carey insisted on the right to be heard in person as well as in print. She was one of only three women delegates to participate in the 1855 Color Convention in Philadelphia, and that victory was won in the face of significant opposition to women speakers. As a result, she faced criticism and derision in abolitionist newspapers. Some critics took particular issue with her willingness to transgress gender boundaries. And so, while Mary Angela Carey seems to have always occupied the outer limits of nation and gender, positionality was both a blessing and a curse. She was not invested in the respectability politics that were so important to Black political leaders during the period, and she paid a price for it. 
The contemporary discourse, she is someone theorist Fred Moten and Stephanie O'Hani might describe as a subversive intellectual. Over the span of seven, seven decades, she had carried two on many professional roles, including educator, abolitionist, editor, writer, critic, and entrepreneur. I wish my colleague Jim Casey was here had, um, looking through um, archives and records as well. He's found evidence that Mary Ann Shakari also had a, a small side business, but when it is Matonic, um, yeah. uh, I, I think it's incredible. Um, she was never not hustling. <laughs> Um, and yet, you know, in spite of all of these accomplishments, her legacy has usually has been continually circumscribed by gender. And so we have an example of W. E. Boris, for example, um, compiling a list of notable black women, but then, you know, he has to boys a little bit off, right? He has to explain that she's a little bit well educated, vivacious, with determination shining from her sharp eyes. Um, but then also that she's tall and slim. A ravishing dream born beauty, a twilight of the races, which we call them a And here, the voice description or summary of Chad Carey's person, life, and work is significant because it points to the way that Chad Carey's prodigious cultural contributions have, were minimized by the fact of her gender. On the other hand, her male colleagues and interlocutors have enjoyed significant critical attention um, without such gender descriptions, right? And when we think about people like Frederick Douglass, Martin Lane, Lillian Still, and Henry Bibb, um, can we begin to see some of these discrepancies? These discrepancies continue today. And so I would say that, um, you know, even a really basic search of online databases that you might use um, if you are an academic researcher or even um, a, sort of a late high school researcher, something like the Ellen bibliography um, reveals fewer than 20 scholarly works about men in that um, a similar search of the Arts of Humanities Citation Index reveals even fewer citations. The lack of critical attention to scholars is actually unusual, given that during her lifetime, her outspokenness and writing in public was frequently accepted to news and even gossip. And here I refer not only to early reports about her activism and publications like the North Star, but the actually harsh criticism that she faced for her political interventions in newspapers like Henry Bibb's The Voice of the Future. Why is now then the right time for collections following the essay about Mary and Chuck Perry? We've been working toward this moment incrementally. In June 2018, um, when I say we, I use we in the broad sense, actually. Um, in June 2018, Chad Perry was a subject of an overlooked young more obituary in the New York Times. The column is meant to make amends for the um, newspaper's historic disinterest in the life stories of individuals who um, are not white men, basically. Um, it's a comprehensive overview of Jack Carey's life, but the column is slightly misleading. Overlooked by whom? In black intellectual circles in the 19th century, in the 19th century, Mary Ann Jack Carey was quickly recognized as a person of fashion. Jack Carey was certainly noticed as a figure of interest by journalists reporting, become, reporting on the comings and goings of color conventions. Reading of Paris frequently catalogs the notable black women written by her contemporaries, and by black scholars in the early part of the 20th century. In black communities in Canada and in the United States, in places like Delaware um, and in Buxton, where many of Shep's descendants currently live, her memory is alive and well. One might argue that the black community's interest and investment in, Sh in Shep Perry never died. What we can say is that despite the resurgence of interest in black life and culture during the 19th century, Chad Carey has never quite been given her due in terms of wider public recognition. It's a paradox that scholars have grappled with over decades. What happens when we rectify this tendency and center Mary Ann Chad Carey's voice in debates about black citizenship and black belonging? What impact can she have on our understanding of black political organizing, free culture, and public life in the 19th century? And what does her varied and long standing engagement in the public sphere tell us about gender and families? These are questions worth answering now. They argue that Mary Ann Chad Carey provides a model for thinking about black feminist intellectual life and black life across the diaspora that has rarely been paralleled. Turning a critical eye towards Chad Carey provides us with insight into various foundations of black life, black intellectual life in North America, and across the black diaspora. Derek Spires had argued that an analysis of the concept of citizenship in Black print culture overemphasizing people like Douglas flattens out the vibrant intellectual network of newspaper correspondence 
convention goers, pamphleteers, and artists whose key texts and forms were more often than not generated collectively. So while Spires focuses on the articulation and enactment of Black citizenship in urban print culture, I suggest that Mary Nancha Carey Brenton work provides an ample addition to such studies. Canadian scholar Winifred Singerling argues that she was one of the most important Black activists and writers in Canada, and she contributed decisively to its Black cultural development, but also helped to shift from her vantage point north of the border the focus of feminist racialist debate in the United States. She fought quite literally for the right to participate in such debates. Such debates. So the time is right for us to take up her mantle. The forthcoming volume of essays draws from the field of Black feminist studies and scholarly investigations of the lives of 19th century Black women whose literary contributions have often been overlooked. Sarah Ellen Strongman has termed the discovery and reformation of Black women writers from the past that took place during the 1970s as the archaeological impulse. I think that there are important parallels to be made with the kinds of impulses that drive our work right now. Um, the sort of shifts that we see um, in terms of scholars who are coming up. Literary scholar Francis Smith Foster explains that not only did African American women appropriate English language to record their truth, but as owning prerogatives to its literary traditions, they consciously revised that tradition to more accurately conform to their truths and their visions. For Foster, 19th century Black women writers used literature as a way of affirming their citizenship and belonging. Foster's work overshadowed, foreshadows other important books like Jewels of the World, in which Carla Peterson traces an interdisciplinary approach to the study of early Black feminists. And there are Peterson argues that Black women writers like Mary Ann Carey were so estranged, estranged from the nation that the interrelated questions of how to address mainstream marginalized society and how to make themselves at home there from the base of their writing. Jane Rhodes' biography of Mary Ann Chad Carey remains, again, one of the most comprehensive single author works about Mary Ann Chad Carey. And her scholarship situates Mary Ann Chad Carey in a long line of Black women journalists. While Mary Ann Carey in here now builds on the work of these scholars, it also seeks to reinvigorate and expand the field by right? bringing scholars on both sides of the US and Canadian border into a sustained conversation. The caretaking and solicit work from scholars on both sides of the US and Canada border speaks to Shed Carey's investment in both countries and her pragmatic approach to citizenship and belonging. Canadian scholars like Nava Walcott and Catherine Kendrick have generated a rich body of scholarship examining both the role of Black women in Canadian national identity and cultural politics. And scholars that are called about Mary and Shed Carey from this period include work by um, writers like Christian Olby and scholar Shirley Dean. More recently, scholars like Nkuku Osaka and Andrea Stone have included chapters that contextualize Mary and Shed Carey's wide impact um, in their scholarly monographs. A recent scholarly edition of her plea for immigration, edited by Fenwell and Angie, has made her work more accessible for post secondary students. A forthcoming anthology, edited by my colleague Nikki Denny, entitled Mary Ann Jen Carey Essential Writing for the 19th Century Black Radical Feminist, promises to redirect attention to the depth and breadth of her intellectual contributions. And so, most of the time when people talk about Mary Ann Carey's writing, they talk about her plea for immigration. One of the great things I'm on about the transcribed volume um, that Nika's work is that there will be more resources for people to study, to teach with, and to understand actually the legacy. Um, the history of the collection at Archives Ontario um, and the work that her descendants have done. Um, here, thinking about particularly the work of Ed and Nancy Robbins. Um, and their stewardship and preservation um, have also been um, incredibly important in the United States moment of this work. Um, and again, there's more work to come. So in this collection of essays, I also center innovative scholarly work from a broad range of interdisciplinary perspectives, including but not limited to historical, literary, gender, ecological, biographical, visual, sound, and performance studies. On these pages, my colleagues and I work across scholarly boundaries as we re examine the work of one of the key figures of Black feminist thought and action in North America. This methodology 
is the form fund that I mentioned, Karen, thinking about the importance of battery costs in black life and black political organizing. And though this is the first collection of scholarly essays on Mary and Michelle Carey, scholars whose work featured here are certainly not the first to delve into her legacy. Um, in fact, one of the lovely things about this volume um, is that Ronaldo Roth actually writes back to one of his earlier essays about Mary and Michelle Carey. So it's been over 20 years since Walcott, one of the leaders of Black um, Studies in Canada, posed the question, who is she and what does she mean? And asks how Black Studies, Canadian Studies, and Black Diasporic Discourses might adopt this 19th century figure as an intellectual guide while arguing for a sustained conversation concerning Blackness in Canada. In some ways, the answer seems simple. Of course, Mary H. F. Carey was a trailblazing North American Black feminist activist and working educator. And yet, despite the groundbreaking work of Walcott and his colleagues in Black Canadian studies and the groundbreaking work of historians like Jane Rose, um, public awareness of Jeff Carey, I think, remains minimal um, in North America. Her commitment to the plight of Black immigrants in Canada, to Canada and her Canadian citizenship. Notwithstanding, um, sometimes you'll hear Black Canadians think of her um, as American, right? And I've had people say to me, you know, she's not really Canadian um, because she's from the States, um, which is an interesting thing to say if you know anything about um, Canadian history at that point, in which uh, basically nobody was Canadian, um, <laughs> unless you were an Indigenous person, almost every single person um, who was not Indigenous, right, was a settler. And so um, in the United States, I think one of the things that is interesting and one of the great things about um, thinking about this project um, is the way in which public commemorations of Jack Carey have actually been increasing in the past few years. So this is a um, plaque from Ontario. Um, this is the Freedom Park in Chatham, Ontario. I don't know how many Canadian people have been there. Um, Chatham is the black settlement that um, Mary Ann Jack Carey um, lived in for a time when she was living in Canada West, um, um, a location from which she also published Provincial Freedom. Um, and it was home to a really vibrant um, black Canadian community. So a lot of people who um, fled child slavery in the US ended up in Chatham because it was sort of close to New England, kind of close to the border. Um, it's a, it was a truly, truly interesting. Um, Piece of Canada at that time. They recently um, erected a statue. Um, again, the history of Mary and Carrie in this area is complicated um, because the um, memorial is situated on a site um, where Chad Carey used to live, right? And so the um, residents of the city were unsuccessful in actually um, being able to preserve the house, um, but they were able to later um, erect this memorial. This is Chad Carey's house in DC. Um, this is a, a mural that um, was mounted last fall in downtown Toronto um, on the side of a historic building called Mackenzie House. Um, and it was uh, created by an artist who really um, thinks deeply about Mary and Jack Carey almost as a cipher for the future. Um, so in this artwork, he's really um, thought about the different kinds of symbols and elements of Mary and Jack Carey's life and has tried to translate them um, into this sort of futuristic vision of what she might be. Um, this is a sculpture by Donna Lane um, that was unveiled this summer in Windsor um, at the University of Windsor. Another tribute to Mary Angela Carey. And of course, this is the most recent um, mural that was unveiled. And so I think thinking about um, sort of increased recognition. Um, and also, um, I think just the way in which Mary Ann Jim Carey has um, literally become sort of etched onto certain sites and locations in the city, also energized this collection and the work of the scholars who are contributing um, to this project um, are also sort of drawing on um, and feeding back into. And with this collection, I demonstrate that we continue to work in a field both defined by Jack Carey and earlier Black feminist intellectuals because the possibilities found there are so general. So the collection itself will be divided into three sections, and they contain research from scholars at all sophisticated careers. 
Um, in the spirit of collaboration and innovation that defines Jack Carey's life and work, we can value in this body. And to me, it's an example of the way Jack Carey has directly impacted um, our methodology right? um, and the kind of scholarly work that we want to see in the world. Um, our collaborations, especially our work with the Center for Black Digital Research, have always held public engagement and accessibility as a central value. At the same time, the scholarly essays of these volumes speak to each other and build on new directions of scholarly inquiry that drive each contributor. As we work towards publication, it's been a great pleasure to read conference programs and to discover new panels and conference papers given by our contributors to actually see them um, sort of workshopping their ideas and actually to spread this knowledge um, in new spaces. It's not an overstatement to say that the work of this volume um, has prompted the greatest scholarly discourse about Mary and Jack Carey. So, in conclusion, I'd say that the work actually doesn't stop there. With the eventual publication and the eventual publication of this volume, I hope that that will see an even greater resurgence of scholarship, art, and performance that testifies to Jack Carey's deep impact, impact of Black culture. So, in the words of Mary and Jack Carey, we will continue to do more and talk less. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to give another plug for Douglas Day, um, our big transcriber bot, and I hope you all enjoy us there too. Thank you so much. We will have everybody come up at the end for questions. Does that sound right? Is that okay? Um, one of the things that these collaborations try to enact is to spread scholarship through the ways in which we as communities actually ingest knowledge, through dance and performance, through articles and biographies, through public art, through public commemorations, through preservation, through the preservation of both buildings and the paper that the family members themselves have kept alive and in their possession for so long. And one of the other ways that we are trying to do that is by creating digital exhibits that allow people all over the world to see some of the records, to see some of the buildings, to see some of um, the textures of the lives as they come together in ways that allow site specificity, right, to, uh, for us to explore Wilmington and Delaware roots, but also to be able to make those links to other places across borders. And the work of doing that allows not only people who are interested in museum exhibits, who were wandering around perhaps downstairs before they came up here, right, in the exhibit hall of the Delaware Museum, but also to do that on the pages of the internet. And we've been attentive to that in the Center for Black Digital Research by creating not only volumes of books and essays that are often just ingested by scholars and interested readers who have the time to sit down and read these kinds of essays, but also to create digital exhibits with curriculum and with for both college students and for high school students. And indeed, we'll be presenting about that at the National Council of Social Studies. Am I getting that right? Um, on Saturday in Philadelphia, where um, thousands of social studies teachers across um, the country are gathering um, to talk um, about the ways in which they, spend, they spread pedagogically so much of the information that has been excluded from public memory. So again, we want to thank everybody in the room who has been involved in both the team. Um, there are many people who are involved in the color attention team. Can you raise your hands? You guys can raise it. There's Thank you. Thank you, our first set life partner over there. And also people who were involved in the commemoration in the newspaper, excuse me, in the in the um, uh, post office and the commemoration of the Shad family that just went up last year. Can you raise your hands or who attended and were part of the organizing? Thank you very much.
So we see that in this room, it's the collective that actually imprints the importance, right, of people who have been long forgotten and bring them back to life on the stage and on the page. I'd also like to ask people who are involved in dance productions and oral histories about um, Mary and Shad Carey throughout Delaware also to raise their hands. Thank you. All right. All right. So again, this collective is the collective that really brings this to life. And in the spirit of that, I'd like to introduce um, Kelly Barnes and Dr. Arlene Wilson, who have been actively creating digital exhibits, and particularly today, we'll talk about the digital exhibit that they're creating about Mary Ann Shakir. Kelly Barnes, who is in alphabetical order of last names. Kelly Barnes is a PhD candidate in the History Department and African American Public Humanities Fellow at the University of Delaware, a program that was based on public adventure graduate student fellowships that preceded it. Her research interests include 18th and early 19th century American history, Black American girlhood. I think many of us know that right, people who are workers who are poor, poor people of color are often denied a childhood, right? Set to work um, way too early. So reinvigorating girlhood as a category is really important in the, in, in the last decade, I would say. In transatlantic material culture, the things that we can touch that have been preserved, again, often the purview, right, of those who have power um, and, and power by that, I mean, gender, financial, et cetera, in order for their things to be preserved in um, the, um, the places um, which transcend history. Interpretive planning and in exhibit design. So we see, Michael, that she has something to do with the kind of Joseph work that you're also doing, bringing people together to do as well. Um, she was the co-chair of the Color Conventions Project website and exhibits committee. She created a digital exhibit called Segregated Sands, Delaware Segregated Beaches during the Jim Crow era, featured on the Delaware Historical and Cultural Affairs website, and is doing preparatory work to transition the current Delaware Historical um, Society exhibition, Collecting Wilmington, Place, Perspective, and Memory into a digital format. She's currently finishing her dissertation, which is currently entitled Creating for Perceptions of Beauty, Black Girls and Their Needlework in the Early National United States. Kelly, thank you for being here and for all of your work. Dr. Arlene Wilson is the Digital Humanities and Africana Scholar for the Special Collections at the University of Delaware and a longtime resident of Wilmington as well. You can see her walking her huskies around. <laughs> you see the one with the husky, that's her. Her scholarly research focuses on African American history and literature, Gothic studies, trauma studies. Her dissertation analyzes the way in which 19th century Black writers used Gothic language to articulate forms of trauma, especially on what she calls soul murder traumas. She's currently working on a library exhibition on slavery and abolition in 19th century Delaware. She's also contributing a book chapter to Live to Let Live or Make Die by Polar Living Death and Childhood Incarceration for a book collection titled The Biopolitics of Childhood. She began the work she is presenting today as a member of the Color Conventions Project team at UD and then continued at Penn State. And she also contributed to the work on Mary Ann Shad Carey, spearheaded by the Center for Black Digital Research at Penn State as a Mellon Just Transformations postdoctor, postdoctoral fellow in 2022. And we're very excited to hear about the work that you'll be doing, and that will be featured on the Delaware Historical Society webpage as well. Thank you guys. Please come on up. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman. It is a pleasure to be here and to see so many faces in person that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, I thank you so, so very much for this opportunity to share our idea for you see where it says page at the bottom? Yes. yes. Go hit down to go forward. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight to share our idea for a classroom oriented pop up exhibit that um, is in celebration of Mary Ann Shannon Carey's 200th anniversary. Before I go on, I want to know that I have a person who stuttered, so thank you for your time and attention. 
So Dr. Wilson and I began this project intending to build on the work that has been accomplished thus far on Mary Ann Shedhair, the section of Jane's book. We wanted to create an informative exhibit for a public audience with the archival finds, the material culture of Mary Ann and the Shedd family. We are building on Dr. Wilson's previous research, locating archival material on Marianne in, at, at, at institutions across the country with the Black Women's Organizing Archive and advised with Dr. Shirley Moody Turner at Penn State. Arlene and I split the task of delving into the archives at the University of Delaware Special Collections, the collections here at Delaware Historical Society, additional online research at various suppositories and items held in private collections. We decided to focus on Marianne, on how Marianne became the woman that she did, including her upbringing amongst the, the strong activist-minded entre entrepreneurial women and men in her family. In doing so, we sought to provide material evidence to engage the viewers with the family and with, the, and with what the family may have used. For instance, her great grandmother, Elizabeth Betty Jackson Shad, owned a famous tea shop that has been mentioned here in on Front Street for black and white mixed company American patrons of Wilmington uh, in the 1700s. Her tea shop was even written about and described in a good amount of detail for us to reimagine um, by Elizabeth Montgomery, a white American female resident of, of Wilmington in her memoir. Marianne's great grandfather, Han Shad, owned a butcher shop at Fourth and Orange Streets here in the city. Her great her grandmother, Amel Amelia Sisto, a native of San Domingue, owned a stall in the Second Street Market House in the city, selling sausages, coffee, cake, and other foods. Her step-grandmother, step Amel Amelia, aka Aunt Sally Shad, owned a catering business and is believed to have created a unique recipe for ice cream, enjoyed even by First Lady Dolly Madison and the President on occasion. Her grandfather, Chair Jeremiah Shad was known as a quote, principal bit butcher famous for curing meats, unquote, in his French Street shop near Kent Street here in the city. And in addition, he established a collar business in the city. All, some of these locations have been found listed in Wilmington city directories right here at the Historical Society. So you can imagine all of these being plotted on a map. So, so that you can see how they made their presence known in, in the city throughout the 1700s and 1800s. Her mother, Harriet Burton Pernell Shad, was an activist advocating for abolitionism with her husband, Abraham Dora Shad. And Abraham was also a member of the color conventions movement, inviting his children along to two conventions, for instance, in Philadelphia, at times piquing their interest in movement for social justice. Additionally, her sisters and brothers were present forces in her life. They were well-educated, becoming teachers, farmers, correspondent and publisher for her newspaper, Civil War soldiers, a speaker up at the Mississippi legislature, lawyer and clerk for the Arkansas Circuit Court. And I just want to note here in the background, um, in the additional research that we did, on online research that we did, we found a journal uh, writ written by Garrison Shad, her brother, um, that notes different family details, um, the, the births and deaths of people who went to visit it and uh, items that he may have bought because he was a farmer and he farmed with, with, with his sons, um, items that they may have bought. So it's material things like that that are really exciting to see you, you, you heard about them and you know pe people were uh, 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 visited or they they farmed or um, may have done certain, certain things, but, but to see their these events actually in a person's handwriting means something completely different and really becomes um, present for you.
Thus, all of this famil famil familial black excellence fostered and supported all that Mary Ann was able to create and execute during her lifetime. Many of us know, so I will only briefly list them once again here to um, celebrate her. She, she was an educator in Wilmington, Delaware, North Norristown, Pennsylvania, Trenton, New Jersey, New, New York City, Windsor, Chatham, Canada West, and finally in Washington, D.C. She was an activist fighting for several causes, as we've heard, including ab abolitionism, immigration to Canada, labor rights, the suffrage and temperance movement. She was a publisher, the first black Amer American woman to do so. She was a union recruiter hired by Martin De Delaney and one other to recruit for regiments in Connecticut and in Indiana. And the one connection that I love is her recruit recruitment work um, in, in Indianapolis for the 28th Infantry. This regiment of, sol of soldiers traveled from Richmond, Virginia to Galveston, Texas to announce the end of the war, which we now know today as Juneteenth. She likely recruited and personally knew some of these men. And this is something I know, I learned about this from a presentation of the, um, the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, DC. I had never made that connection before I saw their presentation in, in September. So this is uh, further research that can, can be done into the men who were part of this regiment to see if their documents to connect her uh, with them. And finally, she was a lawyer. She, she was the first to enroll in Howard Law School and one of the first to graduate with her degree in her 60s. Um, so this is what we have done thus far. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Wilson who will further discuss her ideologies and how she was truly ahead of her time in terms of how she hopes, what she hopes for in society. Thank you, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. I want to thank the Delaware Historical Society for hosting this event, and Dr. Mariah for giving Kelly and I some brief space to talk about our research. I greatly appreciate it. When Kelly and I embarked on this research project, we wanted to ensure the story we told placed Marianne Shen Carey within an accurate familial and historical context. As Kelly's presentation shed light on the Shad family, in particular the accomplishments of Shad women, I want to share a little bit about the historical realities Marianne and her family faced as Black residents in the city of Wilmington in the early 1830s, because it provides a more accurate measure of what they overcame in order to achieve their extraordinary accomplishments. However, our research challenges common scholarly beliefs about why the Shad family left Wilmington and moved to Westchester, Pennsylvania in 1833. This move required a great sacrifice for the family as it meant they left behind their home, their many businesses, and their tight-knit African-American community of which they were known as the movie family. Scholars such as Jane Rose, who wrote the seminal biography on Marianne Shad Carey, claimed the Shad family left Wilmington in 1833 and moved north to secure their children's education. While this is true, the Delaware law in 1833 forbade Black children admission to public schools and that the backlash against free Black residents began to intensify in 1831. I have found Chester County tax records of 1834 revealing the Shad family could not pay for their children's education and relied upon the county to cover the cost of their tuition and school taxes. Although this record does not list the school the Shad children attended, it does list the children's names and, and shows the county covered these costs up until about 1837 to 1838. So what this tells us is that the, the Shad family um, left behind their, their, their livelihoods. Um, and where our exhibit strives to pose the argument that they left for 
other reasons, we'll put it that way, that I'll discuss in just a moment, that they didn't just leave Wilmington. They likely did not just leave the city only for the benefit of their children's education. This is a copy of the uh, Chester County uh, tax record. Um, the SHAD children are listed about halfway down in the first comma. Um, and I have several records. I have records from 1834 to, like I said, about 1837, 1838. While the family's decision to move to Chester may have, in part, been related to the children's education, our research uncovered an event in Seaford, Delaware, in October 1834, during the height of the Nat Turner Rebellion and the ensuing white paranoia that followed, that may have contributed to the family's decision to leave. As both a border state and a slave state, the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion in August 1831 struck fear in many white Delawareans, especially those living in Kent and Sussex counties where slavery still reigned and was ongoing. That's not to say that we didn't have a few slaves, a handful of slaves in the city of Wilmington, but the bulk of uh, um, men and women and children held in bondage was um, in the lower uh, two counties, Kent and Sussex. White residents worried that a slave rebellion in a neighboring slave state, like the Nat Turner Rebellion in Southampton, Virginia, for example, could spill over into Delaware. Or worse, slaves held captive within the state might also rise up. Capitalizing on this fear just a few weeks after the Turner uprising, a group of white men from Seaford, Delaware, staged a phony slave rebellion along the banks of the Nat Turner River, not far from the town of Seaford. With some of the white men donning black scars to appear black, they fired upon other white men in their group who appeared to fall dead. This scene was witnessed by several white families walking, walking along the banks of the river with their family, and it caused a scene of panic that spiraled into terror that a black rebellion was on the way. Several witnesses ran into the center of Seaford proclaiming, proclaiming that the blacks were rising up against them. News of this fake rebellion spread quickly, reaching Dover and Wilmington within a day or two. Although authorities quickly discovered this uprising was nothing more than a hoax and reassured the public that no African Americans were involved and they didn't even know about the rebellion, um, or the, the hoax rebellion, and that newspapers even called it the secret prank, lawmakers were alarmed by white citizens' panicked responses and the level of terror this fake incident incited. Though this event was a prank, a hoax, played by white actors to instill fear in their white neighbors, it led lawmakers to preemptively act, to be ready in case a slave uprising in the state ever occurred. After the Seaford prank, Deller began to gradually reinstitute the restrictive black codes from the 17th, excuse me, the 18th century. Among other things, these codes restricted African Americans from gathering in groups larger than three, which included gatherings in private residences. It forbade Black children from attending public schools, and it also made it illegal for Black men to reside within one mile of the city or town limit with a polling station during the week in which white men voted in state and national elections. This placed incredible financial strain on Black families, and left women and children vulnerable to possible violence and assault during the absence of their fathers, brothers, and husbands. These historical chain events lead us to believe that the Shad family were among many Black families that left Wilmington to escape these oppressive and dangerous measures. And, and I have to say here that it wasn't until I actually had my onboarding with the University of Delaware to just started in uh, September 1st, and I was speaking to a couple of my colleagues just casually in some of our onboarding conversations just to kind of meet and greet and to know me. And I mentioned this fact that I had uncovered in my recent research. And three or four of the individuals who I had these conversations with were, who were African American, they're like, oh my God, I really think you're explaining something that's been a question in my family for generations. Half of our family is here in Wilmington, and the other half is Chester. And we have no idea how they ended up there. And so I started to look into 
but there were other families that were fleeing Wilmington at this time as well. So these families, they left their homes, their towns, their communities, their social standing within these communities, their networks, their livelihood to attain the life and freedoms they deserved, and also possibly to ensure their children's education. Indeed, we might read the family, the Shad family's move to Chester as a precursor to what later would be many family members in the Shad family emigrating to Canada during the 1850s in response to the fugitive slave law and growing hostilities, hostilities towards African Americans. To conclude then, Marianne Chad Carey and her family moved to Chester when she was 10 years old and she and her siblings did receive a solid education. They attended a Quaker school, although it was still a search for the name of the Quaker school, um, but they did attend a Quaker school and attain their education. She would go on to fight for the rights of African Americans, women, and labor workers. She became a savvy strategist who found ingenious ways to navigate around the patriarchal system, even within the Black liberation movement, that sought to limit her role and the role of and voices of women and especially Black women. However, echoes of Marianne Shedd Carey's words or ideas and her philosophies are evident in the language of her civil rights laws nearly 100 years later. Both the ideas and language in her speech break every yoke, which argues that one's religion, race, or gender should have no bearing on one's rights or freedoms. It is clearly recognizable in the language of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, or national origin. Mary Ann Shedd Carey was an, extra an extraordinary woman who in many respects was ahead of her time. The language or tone, I should say, that earlier scholars use when writing about Mary Ann Shedd Carey hits her as um, not bitter, but sharp, um, <laughs> argumentative, <laughs> difficult. And in a sense, she was really ahead of her time. It was really actually one of our colleagues, Brandy Locke, who has done a digital exhibit on Mary Ann Shedd Carey, who reminded us, no, because if she was a woman today, we wouldn't think anything of this. And she's ahead of her time. So Kelly and I are proud and honored that our research can contribute to the growing efforts to tell this extraordinary woman's story to a modern audience. And thank you very much for your time and for the opportunity to share our work with you today. Have time for some questions? 